to imagine a mudlark is to initially think of positive connotations. For lark has the same meaning as adventure, to cavort or play in the mud. Indeed, searching the muddy banks of rivers, scavenging through sludge for items of historical value such as buttons, badges, pipes and coins, discarded or lost over the centuries, is a popular hobby today, made all the much easier by modern protective clothing and metal detectors. But this was not always so, and it used to be far from a fun leisure activity. It was once a desperate means of subsistence, and a filthy one at that. Work solely for the poorest in society, and without the necessary skills to improve their lot, with more gainful employment. Whilst the mudlark is synonymous with the Victorian era, from the 18th century scavengers were searching the muddy shores of London's River Thames at low tide for anything that could be sold on to dealers for money. It was an independent but meagre living. How much you could make would depend on how fast you could work to find coal, rags, bones, rope and nails between the tides and, of course, luck. London was a busy port that saw constant traffic of cargo on barges and ships, so mudlarks would take any opportunity to plunder coal or iron from vessels they could reach to supplement their living. Mudlarking was usually carried out by male children or the elderly, if the latter could still manage its physical demands, but women and children could also be found picking through muck. And festering muck it certainly was, for, as you can imagine, Searching through filth presented a danger to health coming from excrement, waste and sewage, not to mention the corpses of humans, dogs and cats that would wash up on the banks. It's no small wonder that the already dishevelled looking mudlarks would have smelt foul from being coated in foreshore detritus. This was, therefore, surely one of the worst Victorian jobs. You can also find out about bone grubbers and pure finders in my other videos on the channel. Check the description and end screen for links. In this video, you will learn about the wretched lives of mudlarks in London in the 1840s as observed by the Victorian journalist Henry Mayhew. He documented the state of working people in London for a series of articles in a newspaper the Morning Chronicle, that were later compiled into the book London Labour and the London Poor. You will hear a detailed account of the desperate conditions these scavengers endured in order to scrape a living, including intriguing interviews with those who were trapped in this form of work. Before we start, please consider clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. These two things really do show your support and help the channel grow so I can bring you more. Thank you. Check out the description for links to more interesting videos about the Victorians and take a look at the channel page for even more content. There is another class who may be termed river finders. Although their occupation is connected only with the shore, they are commonly known by the name of mudlarks, from being compelled, in order to obtain the articles they seek, to wade sometimes up to their middle through the mud left on the shore by the retiring tide. These poor creatures are certainly about the most deplorable in their appearance of any I have met with in the course of my inquiries. They may be seen of all ages, from mere childhood to positive decrepitude, crawling among the barges at various wharfs along the river. It cannot be said that they are clad in rags, for they are scarcely half covered by the tattered indescribable things that serve them for clothing. Their bodies are grimed with the foul soil of the river, and their torn garments stiffened up like boards with dirt of every possible description. Among the mudlarks may be seen many old women, and it is indeed pitiable to behold them, especially during the winter. Bent nearly double with age and infirmity, paddling and groping among the wet mud for small pieces of coal, 
chips of wood, or any sort of refuse washed up by the tide. These women always have with them an old basket or an old tin kettle in which they put whatever they chance to find. It usually takes them a whole tide to fill this receptacle, but when filled, it is as much as the feeble old creatures are able to carry home. The mudlarks generally live in some court or alley in the neighborhood of the river, and as the tide recedes, crowds of boys and little girls, some old men and many old women, may be observed loitering about the various stairs, watching eagerly for the opportunity to commence their labors. When the tide is sufficiently low, they scatter themselves along the shore, separating from each other and soon disappear among the craft lying about in every direction. This is the case on both sides of the river, as high up as there is anything to be found, extending as far as Vauxhall Bridge and as low down as Woolwich. The mudlarks themselves, however, know only those who reside near them and whom they are accustomed to meet in their daily pursuits. Indeed, but with few exceptions, those people are dull and apparently stupid. This is observable particularly among the boys and girls who, when engaged in searching the mud, hold but little converse one with another. The men and women may be passed and repassed, but they notice no one. They never speak, but with a stolid look of wretchedness, they plash their way through the mire their bodies bent down while they peer anxiously about and occasionally stoop to pick up some paltry treasure that falls in their way. The mudlarks collect whatever they happen to find, such as coals, bits of old iron, rope, bones and copper nails that drop from ships while lying or repairing along shore. Copper nails are the most valuable of all the articles they find, but these they seldom obtain, as they are always driven from the neighborhood of a ship while being new sheathed. Sometimes the younger and bolder mudlarks venture on sweeping some empty coal barge, and one little fellow with whom I spoke, having been lately caught in the act of so doing, had to undergo for the offense seven days imprisonment in the House of Correction. This, he says, he liked much better than mudlarking, for while he stayed there, he wore a coat and shoes and stockings, and though he had not much over to eat, he certainly was never afraid of going to bed without anything at all, as he often had to do when at liberty. He thought he would try it on again in the winter, he told me, saying it would be so comfortable to have clothes and shoes and stockings then, and not be obliged to go into the cold, wet mud of a morning. The coals that the mudlarks find, they sell to the poor people of the neighborhood at one pence per pot, holding about fourteen pounds. The iron and bones and rope and copper nails which they collect, they sell at the rag shops. They dispose of the iron at five pounds for one pence, the bones at three pounds a one pence, rope a half pence per pound, wet, and three quarters pence per pound, dry and copper nails at the rate of four pence per pound. They occasionally pick up tools such as saws and hammers. These they dispose of to the seamen for biscuit and meat, and sometimes sell them at the rag shops for a few half pence. In this manner, they earn from two and a half pence to eight pence per day, but rarely the latter sum. Their average gains may be estimated at about three pence per day. The boys, after leaving the river, sometimes scrape their trousers and frequent the cab stands, and try to earn a trifle by opening the cab doors for those who enter them or by holding gentlemen's horses. Some of them go, in the evening, to a ragged school in the neighborhood of which they live, more, as they say, because other boys go there than from any desire to learn. At one of the stairs in the neighborhood of the pool, I collected about a dozen of these unfortunate children. There was not one of them over twelve years of age, and many of them were but six. 
it would almost be impossible to describe the wretched group. So motley was their appearance, so extraordinary their dress, and so stolid and inexpressive their countenances. Some carried baskets filled with the produce of their morning's work, and others old tin kettles with iron handles. Some, for want of these articles, had old hats filled with the bones and coals they had picked up, and others, more needy still, had actually taken their caps from their own heads and filled them with what they had happened to find. The muddy slush was dripping from their clothes and utensils, and forming a puddle in which they stood. There did not appear to be among the whole group as many filthy cotton rags to their backs as, when stitched together, would have been sufficient to form the material of one shirt. There were the remnants of one or two jackets among them, but so begrimed and tattered that it would have been difficult to have determined either the original material or make of the garment. On questioning one, he said his father was a coal-backer. He had been dead eight years. The boy was nine years old. His mother was alive. She went out charring and washing when she could get any such work to do. She had one shilling a day when she could get employment, but that was not often. He remembered once to have had a pair of shoes, but it was a long time since. It was very cold in winter, he said, to stand in the mud without shoes. But he did not mind it in the summer. He had been three years mudlarking and supposed he should remain a mudlark all his life. What else could he be? For there was nothing else that he knew how to do. Some of the days he earned one pence, and some days four pence. He never earned eight pence in one day. That would have been a jolly lot of money. He never found a saw or a hammer. He only wished he could. They would be glad to get hold of them at the Dollies. He had been one month at school before he went mudlarking. Some time ago he had gone to the ragged school, but he no longer went there for he forgot it. He could neither read nor write, and did not think he could learn if he tried, ever so much. He didn't know what religion his father and mother were, nor did know what religion meant. God was God, he said. He had heard he was good, but didn't know what good he was to him. He thought he was a Christian, but he didn't know what a Christian was. He had heard of Jesus Christ once, when he went to a Catholic chapel, but he never heard tell of who or what he was, and didn't particular care about knowing. His father and mother were born in Aberdeen, but he didn't know where Aberdeen was. London was England, and England, he said, was in London, but he couldn't tell in what part. He could not tell where he would go to when he died, and didn't believe anyone could tell that. Prayers he told me, were what people said to themselves at night. He never said any, and didn't know any. His mother sometimes used to speak to him about them, but he could never learn any. His mother didn't go to church or to chapel, because she had no clothes. All the money he got, he gave to his mother, and she bought bread with it, and when they had no money, they lived the best way they could. Such was the amount of intelligence manifested by this unfortunate child. Another was only seven years old. He stated that his father was a sailor who had been hurt on board a ship and been unable to go to sea for the last two years. He had two brothers and a sister, one of them older than himself, and his elder brother was a mudlark like himself. The two had been mudlarking more than a year, they went because they saw other boys go and knew that they got money for the things they found. They were often hungry and glad to do anything to get something to eat. Their father was not able to earn anything and their mother could get but little to do. They gave all the money they earned to their mother. They didn't gamble and play at pitch and toss when they had got some money, but some of the big boys did on the Sunday when they didn't go a mud larking. He couldn't tell me why they did nothing on a Sunday, only they didn't, though sometimes they looked about to see where the best place would be on the next day. 
He didn't go to the ragged school. He should like to know how to read a book, though he couldn't tell what good it would do him. He didn't like mudlarking, but would be glad of something else, but didn't know anything else that he could do. Another of the boys was the son of a dock laborer, casually employed. He was between seven and eight years of age, and his sister, who was also a mudlark, formed one of the group. The mother of these two was dead, and there were three children younger than themselves. The rest of the histories may easily be imagined, for there was a painful uniformity in the stories of all the children. They were either the children of the very poor, who, by their own improvidence or some overwhelming calamity, had been reduced to the extremity of distress, or else they were orphans, and compelled from utter destitution to seek for the means of appeasing their hunger in the mud of the river. That the majority of this class are ignorant and without even the rudiments of education and that many of them from time to time are committed to prison for petty thefts cannot be wondered at, nor can it even excite our astonishment that once within the walls of a prison and finding how much more comfortable it is than their previous condition, they should return to it repeatedly. As for the females growing up under such circumstances, the worst may be anticipated of them, and in proof of this I have found, upon inquiry, that very many of the unfortunate creatures who swelled the tide of prostitution in Ratcliffe Highway and other low neighbourhoods in the east of London have originally been mudlarks, and only remained at that occupation until such time as they were capable of adopting the more easy and more lucrative life of the prostitute. As to the numbers and earnings of the mudlarks, the following calculations fall short of, rather than exceed, the truth. From execution dock to the lower part of Limehouse Hole, there are fourteen stairs or landing places by which the mudlarks descend to the shore in order to pursue their employment. There are about as many on the opposite side of the water similarly frequented. At King James Stairs in Wapping Wall, which is nearly a central position, from 40 to 50 mudlarks go down daily to the river. The mudlarks, using the other stairs, are not so numerous. If, therefore, we reckon the number of stairs on both sides of the river at 28 and the average number of mudlarks frequenting them at 10 each, we shall have a total of 280. Each mudlark, it has been shown, earns on an average three pence a day, or one shilling six pence per week, so that the annual earnings of each will be three pounds eighteen shillings, or, say, four pounds a year, and hence the gross earnings of the two hundred and eighty will amount to rather more than one thousand pounds per annum. But there are in addition to the mudlarks employed in the neighbourhood of what may be called the pool, many others who work down the river at various places as far as Blackwall, on the one side, and at Deptford, Greenwich and Woolwich, on the other. These frequent the neighbourhoods of the various yards along shore where vessels are being built and whence, at certain times, chips, small pieces of wood, Bits of iron and copper nails are washed out into the river. There is but little doubt that this portion of the class earn much more than the mudlarks of the pool, seeing that they are especially convenient to the places where the iron vessels are constructed, so that the presumption is that the number of mudlarks at work on the banks of the Thames, especially if we include those above bridge, and the value of the property extracted by them from the mud of the river may be fairly estimated at double that which is stated above, or say 550, gaining 2,000 pounds per annum. As an illustration of the doctrines I have endeavoured to enforce throughout this publication, I cite the following history of one of the above class. It may serve to teach those who are still sceptical as to the degrading influence of circumstances upon the poor that many of the humbler classes, if placed in the same easy position as ourselves, would become, perhaps, quite as 
respectable members of society. The lad of whom I speak was discovered by me now nearly two years ago, mud-larking on the banks of the river near the docks. He was a quick, intelligent little fellow, and had been at the business, he told me, about three years. He had taken to mudlarking, he said, because his clothes were too bad for him to look for anything better. He worked every day with twenty or thirty boys, who might all be seen at daybreak with their trousers tucked up, groping about and picking out the pieces of coal from the mud on the banks of the Thames. He went into the river up to his knees, and in searching the mud, he often ran pieces of glass and long nails into his feet. When this was the case, he went home and dressed the wounds, but returned to the riverside directly. For should the tide come up, he added, without my having found something, why, I must starve till next low tide. In the very cold weather, he and his other shoeless companions used to stand in the hot water, that ran down the riverside from some of the steam factories to warm their frozen feet. At first he found it difficult to keep his footing in the mud, and he had known many beginners fall in. He came to my house at my request the morning after my first meeting with him. It was the depth of winter, and the poor little fellow was nearly destitute of clothing. His trousers were worn away up to his knees. He had no shirt, and his legs and feet which were bare, were covered with chillblains. On being questioned by me, he gave the following account of his life. He was fourteen years old. He had two sisters, one fifteen and the other twelve years of age. His father had been dead nine years. The man had been a coal whipper, and, from getting his work from one of the publican employers in those days, had become a confirmed drunkard. When he married, he held a situation in a warehouse where his wife managed the first year to save four pounds, ten shillings, out of her husband's earnings. But from the day he took to coal whipping, she had never saved one halfpenny. Indeed, she and her children were often left to starve. The man, whilst in a state of intoxication, had fallen between two barges, and the injuries he received had been so severe that he had lingered in a helpless state for three years before his death. After her husband's decease, the poor woman's neighbors subscribed one pound five shillings for her, and with this sum she opened a greengrocer's shop and got on very well for five years. When the boy was nine years old, his mother sent him to the Red Lion School at Greenbank, near Old Gravel Lane, Rathcliffe Highway. She paid one pence a week for his learning. He remained there for a year. Then the potato rot came and his mother lost upon all she bought. About the same time, two of her customers died, thirty shillings in her debt. This loss, together with the potato disease, completely ruined her and the whole family had been in the greatest poverty from that period. Then she was obliged to take all her children from their school, that they might help to keep themselves as best they could. Her eldest girl sold fish in the streets, and the boy went to the riverside to pick up his living. The change, however, was so great that shortly afterwards, the little fellow lay ill eighteen weeks with the ague. As soon as the boy recovered, his mother and his two sisters were taken bad with a fever. The poor woman went into the great house, and the children were taken to the fever hospital. When the mother returned home, she was too weak to work, and all she had to depend on was what her boy brought from the river. They had nothing to eat, and no money until the little fellow had been down to the shore and picked up some coals, selling them for a trifle. And hard enough he had to work for what he got, poor boy, said his mother to me on a future occasion, sobbing. Still, he never complained, but was quite proud when he brought home enough for us to get a bit of meat with. And when he has sometimes seen me downhearted, he has clung round me neck and assured me that one day God would see us cared for, if I would put my trust in him. As soon as his mother was well enough, she sold fruit in the streets or went out washing when she could get a day's work. 
the lad suffered much from the pieces of broken glass in the mud. Some little time before I met with him, he had run a copper nail into his foot. This lamed him for three months, and his mother was obliged to carry him on her back every morning to the doctor. As soon, however, as he could hobble, to use his mother's own words, he went back to the river and often returned, after many hours' hard work in the mud, with only a few pieces of coal, not enough to sell, even to get them a bit of bread.